It's those opening chords, really. Um, I mean, if you can't get off on those early chords, then actually you shouldn't be listening to rock and roll at all. You should go and take up needlework or something. Basically, the thing that I realised that there was good music, this great, great music, but it also carried a message. It was the blues, I suppose, but rhythm and blues, you know, not sort of some poor old guy out in the swamp, basically just moaning. Uh, it was, it was, you know, the, the the message of the blues contained with that incredible music that was around at, at that time, and about everything, everything started to happen really fast. Just before I left school, Roger Daltrey uh, saw me walking in the street, and uh, I was carrying the homemade bass guitar under my arm, no case or anything. And he came up and said. Uh, I hear you play bass guitar, and I said, yeah. Uh, he said, um, would well, you want to come and like, try out for my band? You know, sort of, uh, we're uh, working, we're getting 30 shillings a night, playing pubs and stuff like that. So uh, I joined, and the rhythm guitar wasn't too hot, so eventually I brought in Pete. People in London started to like rhythm and blues, you know, which is essentially a good form of music. Groups started to play it, and there was an audience for rhythm and blues. We called ourselves the Detours, and we played with uh, a different drummer. So he's a fellow about, he's quite old, he's about 30 years old. And eventually we sort of started to overtake him musically. And, uh, just before we uh, made the first record, um, the record company decided they wanted another drummer and they tried to make us uh, use this drummer who uh, used to play for a band, Liverpool band called The Foremost. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a good drummer but he just didn't seem right, he wasn't, you know, he didn't fit in with the band. And then sort of Keith joined up. Very first ever! Record as the U or so called. Can't explain that we have 14 in the town. Immediately you're open to an, a really new and interesting kind of way of writing. Got a feeling inside. Can't explain. The power that they've managed to, to get onto tape was incredible. I feel hot and cold. The simplicity of the sound they made, you know, the one guitar, bass and drums, um, great sound, great song, bam, straight in there, you know. The Who had previously been known as the High Numbers and were a mod band in the north, northwest of London, west of London, they were playing. And they were spotted by Chris Stamp, the brother of Terence Stamp, and Kit Lambert, who was the son of Constance Lambert, the opera singer. They were in a management partnership looking for a band. They saw the high numbers and saw the potential in them at once. People knew who the high numbers were and they tied themselves very much to the mod movement. Uh, they had a single called Zoot Suit exactly what the mods used to wear. So they, they, were, they were right into that scene, which was exactly what uh, Stamp and Lambert were looking for because they wanted a band with, with a fan base that they could work with. But of course they knew they had to expand that. 
and Can't Explain was the first attempt really to broaden them out a bit. It's a great pop single and um, it, you know, it was the first single that they had. Uh, it's a pretty good way of introducing yourself to the world, I think. The perfect introduction to a career that took off from that moment and in a way everything was built on that one single. Well, I mean, the first record that everybody remembers is I Can't Explain. It wasn't in fact the first record because there was a thing by the high numbers called I'm a Face or I'm the Face. Uh, and then came I Can't Explain. I Can't Explain was the sort of first attempt that Pete had to get across the inarticulacy of teenage angst. Um, and it was done with the help and cooperation of Shel Taumi, who was an American producer who had a bit of a track record in the States. And he came across and worked with Pete on I Can't Explain. Uh, Pete was heavily influenced at that time by the Kinks. And it just so happened that Shel Taumi was also the Kinks producer. So the record owes a debt to the Kinks sound and feedback and one or two other things. Pete's always admitted to that and given them credit for it. The basic chord structure is a very simple three chord rock and roll structure of the verse, which is the chord of E major, the chord of D major, the chord of A major, and once again the chord of E major. Now that you'll hear in hundreds, literally hundreds of songs, and it basically comes from a blues structure. But then what uh, Pete Townsend did after that was he decided to create a little section that would take him up to the bridge and therefore onto the chorus, which are the same chords as the verse. So he would then go from the E major to the D major to the A major to a B major, which would then allow him to go to this bridge, which would then go E major, C sharp minor seventh, A major, back up to B major, back to the chorus. The only other part of the song is a little solo where it just stays in E. The band used their bass guitarist, John Entwistle, more to supplement Pete Townsend's guitar playing as a rhythm guitar more than a bass, which is why, um, as obviously the Who's music developed, um, Entwistle's bass becomes very much a singular instrument instead of part of the rhythm section. It's a very simple song from a, a musical structure, yet somehow there's lots of little things going on, the little harmonies and, you know, the question and answers between Townsend and Roger Daltrey are fantastic. And when I heard it, it was rather like I'd found my family, I'd found my tribe. It was the sort of the missing link between the music I was being taught at school and the music that I wanted to play. It's all about frustration and not being able to explain how you feel about things and coping with life's problems when you're a, a, a West London teenager, maybe uh, dabbling in pills, spending lots of money on clothes, riding scooters. Uh, it was an anthem for the mods. and. Uh, as such, it made a tremendous uh, impact because not only was it a very exciting performance by The Who, it also defined their, their image. The lyrics about a tongue-tied boy who can't explain what he wants to say to his girlfriend. I mean, who can't relate to that? It brought everybody together as well. It, it gave you a voice as, as, as youth. It was about being a kid growing up in that part of London and what it was like you know, and, and then he, they would always kind of refer back to, to the, the influences that they knew best 
to, to draw their best material out of. And that's, that's really what the Who were talking about. I can go anyway. It was actually a song that Roger Daltrey had quite a hand in. Um, he always claims to sort of have written half that, half that song. And I think, I might be wrong about this, but I think on certain labels it came out as a Daltrey Townsend composition. Roger always says darkly that he's never received a penny for it either. I think, in many ways, it was probably the first single that actually captured the live performance. Because in the middle of, of uh, the song, there's a solo, but it's not a solo in the normal sense of the word. Keith Moon's taking a drum solo. Pete Townsend sounds like he's smashing his guitar up with feedback and, you know. John Entwistle is making the most tremendous noise on the bass. And it probably is precisely what used to happen when you saw them live. Um, anarchy. For someone to be telling you, you know, you can go any way, anyhow, anywhere, you can do anything, that, that kind of sentiment, um, we like that. We like that a lot. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't remember that being their greatest um, single, but you know, at least it, it kept them in the public eye. I used to go and see the band playing live at the Marquee and all their clubs, the small club dates, and uh, people adopted each new Who song with a great joy. <laughs> it was like a <coughs> cause for celebration when Pete came out with another great new song. The Who's early singles just sort of captured the zeitgeist. And again, I mean, Townsend straight out the, the, the blocks was, was just a, a brilliant songwriter. Um, you know, who perhaps has never, everyone looks at Lennon and McCartney and Jagger and Richards as being the, the prime songwriters, but those guys have been around for a few years by this point. And if you look at, of course, the very early careers of the Beatles and, and the Stones, it was all cover versions that they were primarily doing. Although The Who included some covers in, in their early material, really Townsend was very, very prolific and very mature already as a songwriter. Um, and that's, you know, the, the same perhaps as Ray Davis in The Kinks was. Um, and that's why these early examples of Who singles are sort of so powerful and still sound so good today. Anyway, anyhow, anywhere. The title came from Pete Townsend, who was stoned one night listening to Charlie Parker. And when he woke up in the morning, those three words were written down on a piece of paper next to him. And so he thought that he would make a song out of that, which is literally what he did. I think because the, the song grew out of the title that Townsend had found, as it were, um, and so they simply made up words to go along with it. It doesn't actually have the subtlety or the mystique of I can't explain, which, which is saying something. Anyway, anyhow, anywhere is just, it's a statement. I can do what I want. It's basically like fuck off to everybody, you know, and that, that came through in the lyrics and the music, everything. Fantastic music. Yeah, yeah. Where do you want to get right there? <laughs> <laughs> they look after us on this show. You know, 
You guys are really too much, and I want to introduce you to the, the guys individually in The Who, because you never get to know their names. You know them as The Who. Everybody says, Who? And you say, you know. What's your, so what's your name? Pete. Pete. At, Pete Townsend, yeah. Pete? And where are you from, Pete? London. From London? Yeah. London where? London, England. <laughs> hey, where'd you learn to play, you know, that's a wild style of uh, playing. Where'd you learn to play the guitar like that? That was bowling. Bowling. <laughs> bowling. Yeah, I could tell. Now we move right along. Yeah. Uh, right over here. Right over here. And you're... Um, John. Home. You're John? John. And you're, and you're from London, sir. From London, too? Yeah. And uh, you must be uh, Roger. I must be. Uh, why are you? Yeah. You're Roger? Roger. And where are you from? Uh, Oz. Roger. <laughs> Here's Roger from Oz. <laughs> And over here, the guy plays the sloppy drums. <laughs> yes. Follow the yellow brick road. What's Indeed. your name? Keith. Keith? My friends call me Keith. You can call me John. Okay, John. I'm gonna, yeah. I just soon call you Roger. Uh, uh, Roger from Oz. What's the, what's the next song you're going to do? My Generation. Your Generation? Yeah. Well, I can really identify with that because I really identify with these guys. I dig them. Uh. And this is a... <laughs> you know... You've got sloppy stage hands around there. <laughs> okay, that's enough. They're going to sing My Generation. This song really goes, and you're going to be surprised what happens because this is excitement and hit it. My Generation. <laughs> statement you know just a, just a name alone my generation it was Townsend was setting himself up as a spokesperson for all of us and uh, we needed people like him to do that um, he's brilliant we thought he was a hero at the time <laughs> very much so Why don't you all fade away don't try and dig what we all The thing I loved about my generation was the fact that, you know, they were using a stutter in the vocals. It was unheard of, you know. And, and I remember loving it, the fact that he would sing, Roger would sing, why don't you all f f f and of course I thought he was going to say fuck off, but it was fade away which was just wonderful. My generation was really, I can't explain, part two in a, in a way. I mean, my generation started off as a blues number, quite slow, and they worked it up. And I think in the beginning, Shel Talmay was involved with it. He certainly gets the credit on the label again. But Lambert by now was getting a finger on the knobs in the control rooms. And he was encouraging Pete to do grander things to extend himself a bit as a composer and a songwriter. Do something Wagnerian, Pete. Do something Wagnerian. And um, Pete, uh, consequently given his head, uh, embellished and, and they worked my generation up into quite a number between them. They were looking for tricks to make the song work and the vocal stammer came up. Um, because it really, it, it's, it's about a pill, it, it's a pilled up mod. Um, if you suffer from an anthetamine overdose, you will stammer. And Roger Daltrey could relate to this instantly. And, but he didn't like doing it. He, he thought that it was maybe taking the mickey out of the people who were buying his records. He was a bit careful about that. It was a sort of anthem for teen Pillheads at the time, the mods again. It was a sort of that whole thing of the kids. The mods used speed quite a bit, and they would, as a result, stammer. Their speech impediment. And during the recording, Roger, who actually has a natural stammer, still does to this day. In the, in, in the middle of his sentences, not a 
beginnings, was doing the vocal, and I think it crept in, and Lambert seized on it, either because he realised that it was something the mods would identify with anyway. I mean, Rogers was just a natural speech impediment. It had nothing to do with speed. But I think Lambert saw the identity thing. I said, do it again, do it again. What, what, what? Is it, what, what you, you know, the, the, the slammer. And uh, and that was how the my g -g 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 generation came about. Great song. It was just um, perfect, really, for the Who that uh, they were summing up this kind of anti anti establishment, anti older generation vibe, uh, telling the rest of the world to clear off. <laughs> it's the title of the first album. It's the mod album. You know, um, it's the only album the Who made when they were mods, and it's an. I mean, for, for a, a mod band, it's almost a heavy metal song. You know, it's, it's this sort of odd juxtaposition of style and content. Um, and everything about that first album sort of put The Who in their place in London at that perfect time, better than any album of its time around that time did for any other band. There they were on the front cover, sh looking sharp suited, you know, the Union Jack jacket, um, absolutely everything about the who it said this is us it spoke to the kids that bought it it's, it's them it's you know we're all the same together this is it this is what's going on it's happening and it's right now and I don't think it's anything's ever quite captured anything in the way that um, you know it wanted to say that um, perhaps the Sex Pistols never mind the bollocks album in 1977 was of a similar um, sort of had a similar impact and appeal but um, I mean that was a long long way down the line and that was what sort of 12 years down the line. It was the album actually that most of the punks 10 years later that was why The Who were never regarded as boring old farts because The Who were punks 10 years before they were punks. If you notice that the Rolling Stones and the Beatles both immediately start to get a little rockier, more guitar influenced in their music after the, the Who and the Kinks have kind of appeared on the scene. Um, plus also my generation is just a brilliant song. I mean, it's just, it's just a, a short, sharp blast of, of energy. Um, you know, it's an adrenaline rush. You know, it's, it's, it, you can feel this, the cheap speed that fueled the writing of the song. What made it so brilliant was the fact that it was immediately jarring. It really clanged on your nerves and it made you sit up and take notice. And it's done in such a sort of swagger. It's wonderful. It's just wonderful. I mean, it's a, a thumbprint, you know, of music, a photograph of, of music that had, you must remember, this had not happened before, what we were hearing. It hadn't happened before, you know. You had Elvis and, you know, you'd had some blues and you'd had a bit of rock and roll. But you hadn't had something quite as raw and energetic. And it was British. It wasn't American. And it had its own stamp. It made it the perfect anti-pop song, which made it the perfect pop song for a certain generation. Try and dig what we all The other great trick they used in my generation was the bass solo. They had this massive wall of equipment, which were like almost like two four by twelve cabinets in one. Um, the sound was louder than any other band you had ever heard.
much do you personally make and what is the, your gross income for a typical week? It's fantastically hard to, to say, you know. I'm sorry. And of course it became the focal point of the destructive stage act, the famous auto-destruction. A uh, mixture of pop art and God knows what other kind of art. <laughs> but the idea was that uh, somehow wrecking things and smashing things up was an artistic statement. And whether the Who invented that or whether they, they drew it from other sources, I don't know. But it was certainly very effective. And my generation was kind of the, uh, the Who's auto-destructive anthem. When, for a brief period, I stopped smashing guitars on the stage because it was costing a lot of money. Kids started shouting out, smash your guitar, Pete, smash your guitar, and sort of getting quite annoyed that I wasn't because to a large percentage of boys that have come to see the group, not girls, uh, geezers that have come to see the group, they came to see, paid their money to see me hit my amplifier with the guitar and perhaps see a guitar break, you know, and at least they wanted to see me try. Purest. The beginning was the the anger, the pure anger, and then later it became sensationalist. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Didn't take long. It was something like that to be noticed and talked about yeah. and broadcast. So it was a. Uh, it started off as a genuine gesture of frustration, a pure gesture of frustration. One day I was banging my guitar around, making noises, and banging it on this ceiling in this club, and the neck broke off, because Rickenbackers are made out of cardboard. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody started to laugh. They're all kind of going, hey, that would teach you to jump around like a lunatic and teach you to be flash. So I thought, what do I do? And I had no recourse but to completely, like, look as though I meant to do it. So I smashed this guitar, <laughs> picked it up, jumped all over the bits, and then picked up the 12-string and carried on as though nothing had happened. And the next day, the place was packed. That was the first gig that uh, our manager, Kent Lambert, had been to, and he thought that was part of the act. So uh, when he found out it wasn't, he said, keep it in. And, uh, we stopped, we stopped about uh, 500 grams worth of guitars later. I must admit that the first time he did it, 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 it pissed me off. Mainly because I'd, I'd struggled so hard to buy my first guitar. I mean, my, my parents had to mortgage the house to get my first guitar. And the ones before that, I actually bought planks of wood and, and I, I made them with my own hands. And to see a guy just get hold of a something which was so precious to me <laughs> and smash it to smooth the rings. I, I used to get kind of angry. Our actual intention is to play out all the adrenaline and all the aggression and show the audience that you are a frustrated character, that you do want to get something out of your system and you do want to do it in front of them. And it's got much more to do with art and music than people imagine. Much, much more to do with pop music than anything else. You didn't start smashing the stuff by ever seeing Hendrix doing it. Oh, no, we were doing it long before <clears throat> when I met Jimmy. I know Hendrix well, as well as anybody knew Hendrix. Yeah. We had a respect for each other. We said to each other, well, stop stealing our act, Hendrix. <laughs> Which we did on several occasions. Really? Sure. And Hendrix said to us, who stop stealing my act? We said, uh, up yours. Once it was possible to smash up a hotel room or, or smash up a load of equipment and then pay for it and get a new lot the next day, of course, it, the, the statement was futile and we should have stopped. It became a bit of an habit. <laughs> There was a period when it went through, it was kind of, they were expected to do it. And 
that got a bit staged, as it were. But then it sort of passed beyond that. It almost became a ritual at the end of the show. And Townsend started to treat it rather differently. So instead of sort of doing it spontaneously and in anger, he would sort of very deliberately take off his guitar and walk to the front of the stage and sort of hold it up like a kind of sacrificial offering. And then smash it to the floor and walk off so he could make it look fairly dramatic and ritual, even though it was clearly staged. It set them apart from the Beatles and the Stones who were a little bit tame and chewy in the way that they were produced. Shel Talmy acknowledged and understood, firstly, that noise was part of their music, and secondly, space within the music actually allowed a pregnant pause where expectation took over. There was a drama about that early stuff from The Who. I don't think My Generation is a classic album. I think it's a very good album. Um, it's got some great songs on it. I mean, t I think typical of the time, it was, it was, you had different versions of different albums for England and America, and America would get all the albums with the hit singles on it. England would get a different album, and the singles wouldn't be on it because they'd already been bought and put up the charts anyway, so it's, it's all kind of weird. Even though it doesn't really figure on lists of top tens and things like that, um, its influence among musicians was huge because it, it defined a whole new sound. It, it serves its purpose as a fine debut, but it's not a classic album by a long shot. I mean, obviously, the, the song itself is, is an absolute classic. Um, and, and that you know, they're, they're a really good Kids All Right is an, a, another example of a you know, great song. And you've got to remember that, that you know, this is, this is very early in Townsend's writing career, and he's doing great. I mean, that's, for me, it sets everything up, I think, in a very exciting way for The Who. I think the album My Generation did more than just set down what The Who were going to be about. It, it set uh, the start of a whole um, style of music. I don't think it was even necessarily called rock at that moment as we know it now. It was called pop then. They were looked upon as a pop band, but it wasn't. It clearly wasn't pop. It was something much bigger than that. It was really, it was pop music becoming more conscious of itself. And it was also that generation becoming conscious of itself as it grew up, that post-war generation now into their mid-late teens, um, kind of defining who and what they were. Around this time, there was a huge furore uh, out in Europe where Roger got sacked from the band as a result of beating Keith Moon up. Uh, and that occurred because Roger was pretty concerned about the performance of The Who at the time. They were tending to fall apart a bit on stage. Uh, and he knew it was drugs. And then he found out that it was Keith who was supplying them. And uh, he walked off stage somewhere out in Holland at the just before the end of their set, went back to the dressing room, found Keith Moon's stash and flushed them down the toilet. Moon came back, found out what he'd done, was pretty upset about it and went for him physically, which is not a good idea with Roger to go for him physically. And uh, Roger retaliated in a pretty uh, over-the-top manner and had to be eventually pulled off him by two roadies. And as a result of that, uh, Roger was sacked for con conduct unbecoming a, <laughs> an officer or something. And um, he was out of the band. And for a limited number of gigs, Townsend sang the lead vocals, which was not terribly successful. Uh, and the result of that was that um, Lambert and Stamp pulled him in and said, you know, you've you know, we want you back in the band, but you've got, but only on certain conditions. And um, the conditions were that, you know, there should be no more violent conduct. And Roger agreed to be per peaceful Percy, as he is quoted as saying.
I think a quick one's a great record, and that's where you can start to see all the all the big ideas that were that Pete Townsend was going to have and try and develop with the Who, and also with his own music over the years. This is where you all start to see it. The Who, in their early days, realised very fast that um, it wasn't about singles. You had to have an album that was cohesive. And they were one of the first bands to do it. Even the Stones and the Beatles, in their very early days, never really appreciated what an album was. It was all about hit singles. It was only later in their careers that they realised that actually what we want to do is create a cohesive amount of work. Pete Townsend was different. Pete Townsend acknowledged and realised that an album gave you an opportunity to present your songs. It wasn't just about one song, it wasn't about a one-off. So it was a perfect opportunity to say to the world, I'm a songwriter and I'm going to give you eight or nine or ten songs and not just one hit single. I think you had an album there where you had a series of quirky, almost heavy pop songs and then you had you know, a mini epic on there which, had, which hadn't been done before. You had a, a little rock opera and that worked in, incredibly well. John Entwistle started coming through with some good songs. Boris the Spider, which is a great novelty song, but it's actually one of those novelty songs that you can hear over and over. Most novelty songs, once you've heard them two or three times, that's it. Um, but Boris the Spider has got enough to it that, that it carries, and it used to become a huge stage favourite. Um, well, because it was the one time he used to step up to the microphone, otherwise he was just hiding at the back next to Keith. All the bass players used to love Boris the Spider because it went Boris the Spider. Boom, 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 boom. A quick one while he's away was really an album that was conspicuous for two things. One was uh, Boris the Spider, which virtually became synonymous with John Entwistle throughout his life uh, with The Who on stage and was the song that he always performed and was always requested that he perform. John used to wear a, a, a spider around his neck, a jeweled spider around his neck. I was very proud of that song. It also very effectively demonstrated what a superb bass player he was. I mean, he was something quite different in the, in the line of bass players. He was, his dexterity uh, was synonymous with a really good lead guitarist. I mean, there were times when you had to listen quite closely to The Who playing on stage to figure out whether it was a guitar being played or a bass, because he would take lead, and, it, and he was probably consummately the best musician in The Who. He played French horn, he did other things of that uh, kind. He knew about, I think he read music as well. He'd been in a youth orchestra as a young man, um, and he was exceptionally gifted. He, he was probably, I mean, Keith Moon was probably the only drummer in the world who could have done what he did as a drummer by virtue of the fact that John Entwistle filled in for him. John Entwistle kept the time. He kept the rhythm quite often, while the improvisation and the thunderous kind of electrical storm that Moon uh, drove was going on in the background but it was Entwistle's skill and his ability to to do two things at once almost on a bass that made him so unique and Boris the Spider was was John's song. You can start to hear a vaguely more psychedelic influence coming in on a track like that um, where obviously the music that is happening now around Pete Townsend is, is starting to influence his own writing. You started to see that, uh, and I suppose I didn't realise at the time that it was Pete Townsend was the, the musical focus. He wasn't the only writer, of course, but he was the musical focus. He was starting to develop different ideas. And of course he came, his dad was a musician as well, you know, played in the RAF bands, played clarinet, I think it was. So he'd, he'd had quite a lot of, of uh, musical education in his home which, you know, not lots of other musicians would necessarily have. They might have come from families where, you know, there was no music apart from what they heard in the radio, which was quite limited. So his musical education was beginning to show and he was experimenting with other ideas. A Quick One doesn't have the hit singles that the My Generation album did. It could have done. Um, they could have put 
Happy Jack and I'm a Boy on it that were written around the same time. But at that time, The Who, along with several other bands, deliberately didn't put songs that had been hits onto their albums, because that was what American bands did, and The Who weren't going to be like that. So what that meant was that Pete Townsend had to come up with more songs, and he didn't quite get the standard that he probably was looking for. There were some good ones, songs like So Sad About Us, um, Run, Run, Run. They're good Pete Townsend songs, but they don't quite have that magic touch that takes them further on. And of course, the most famous thing for um, a quick one is it, it's, got, it's got a quick one while he's away. Two, three. Her man's been gone for nigh on a year. He was due home yesterday, but he ain't here. Her man's been gone for nigh on a year. He was due home yesterday, but he ain't here. It had its weak moments, but it had its very strong moments too. That I saw them perform that once on a show called the Rolling Stones Rock and Roll Circus that I went to for the New Musical Express. Uh, and they were superb. I mean, if that had got out, if they could have shown that at the time, I think it would have made that album huge. But unfortunately, they did it with the Rolling Stones. The Rolling Stones weren't happy with their performance on that, and it took nearly 20 years for the Rolling Stones Rock and Roll Circus to be released. And effectively, the Who play them off the screen. On it. And I think that might have been another reason why Jagger wasn't very keen on having it released at the time. Well, after the explosive blast of My Generation, their first album, which uh, got everybody talking about the Who, uh, there was this feeling, probably developed between uh, Kit Lambert, their manager, and Pete Townsend, that somehow all this energy, this pent-up energy that the Who had, should be channeled in some way into producing something um, with a bit more focus, more direction, in terms of an album. The mini opera, a quick one while he's away, actually started when they were 10 minutes light on the album. This, of course, was because they weren't going to fill it up with the hits that they'd had, so they needed to write something else. And it was Kit Lambert, whose father had been an opera singer, who suggested that you could make a little pop opera, operetta. It does, it takes the elements from an operetta, kind of late, 19th century sort of thing you'd hear in, in a Paris theatre and uses all those elements. Why don't you stop your crying? Here comes either the dirty old sooty engine driver to make you feel all right. And tells, frankly, a, a fairly ridiculous story um, of either the engine driver um, and playing away from home one day. Now, the whole thing was um, a kind of comic observation of uh, working class life in the East End, or maybe in the West End, because that's where they all came from.
Townsend's first stab at combining a lot of teams into a thematic piece. Basically, it's his first mini rock opera. And it works well, but it's in the context of not a three minute track, you know, but an eight, nine minute plus track. And, and it, you remember, this is the 60s. Bands like The Who or, or other bands like them just didn't do this kind of thing. And they'd written a piece, which was, was basically an extended piece of music that worked. I think it worked. I mean, people might say, well, a quick one hasn't got many hit singles on it, or pop songs like My Generation did have. That's all well and good. But My Generation didn't have something as interesting as a quick one while he's away. I mean, when you listen to stuff like Tommy that, that he does later on, um, then of course it pales into insignificance by that. But if you look at it in context, then it's fascinating that already Pete Townsend is, is and the Who themselves musically are looking to push everything outwards. It's a much more, it's got more of a hard rock edge to it, the album. Um, you know, there's vague psychedelic elements and of course it's, it addresses the whole idea of doing a rock opera. It's fun and the band make it fun and they clearly enjoy it and the little tricks they use and the final climax to the song um, it all goes into falsetto as they keep repeating the final chorus over and over and over and they can't quite finish it. Every time you think it's finished it gets going for one more time for another 10 seconds. I loved it. I thought it was a great album. I think it was better than the debut, actually. And I don't think it's been given the credit it's, it's been due. The Who, because immediately they become the voice of the people, the inarticulate voice of the inarticulate people, if you want, have that image and reputation. But Pete Townsend wanted to grow as a songwriter. He wasn't prepared to sit there and just churn out more and more songs about people want to put us down, I can't actually express my feelings. He could express his feelings and he started to want to do that. So he was caught between the devil and the deep blue sea and was a quick one because he knew and understood moving too fast would mean that they lose the crowd. On the other hand, if you don't move, you're going to stagnate. In the end, they probably did move too fast for their own good. Happy Jack is a kid's story on acid, really. Happy Jack as a song is very much a throwaway psychedelic song. It was about someone ironically happy. Not particularly happy, but put on the happy face, as it were. But it had a certain psychedelic, psychedelic edge. 
And I call it psychedelia rather than psychedelic because I think it's slightly different. It was a Who's take on it. The great thing about the Who was that they could merge all those kind of different elements. And Happy Jack is, is where the instrumental elements of the Who just come together so easy that you suddenly realise that they've got themselves a style. Enter this fat sounding bass. Townsend's chord sequences, the way that Daltrey phrases, and of course, moon crashing around all over the place behind. And suddenly the band is just falling into place. So they rode on his head in the There was a lot of songs and films and books and TV programs and plays at the time being written in this slightly obscure attitude and Happy Jack was one of those sort of things, it was a slightly obscure song, it was a pretend story. A Happy Jack is, is um, that's, that's more of a sort of frivolous sort of psychedelic kind of sort of song. But it was something that that made sense, even though you didn't know what it was about. I think it confused people a little bit. Because they seemed rather some people thought they were rather throwaway and not really worthy of the who. In retrospect actually they do have a certain charm about them. But it wasn't um, I mean, people expected so much from her. They wanted a, an explosion of violence. They wanted my generation, you know, six times a night. <laughs> but you can't do that. You can't sustain a band um, um, as a live act or as an album-making group uh, just with um, two or three songs all the same style. Obviously, Pete was thinking about diversifying. They couldn't prevent Jack from being happy. This the group has had no history, well. and I've hated One him ever since I began. Since I've been doing the bulk of the, the thing writing. is that he does no writing, and I've been through most uh, of it. You know, I've been doing most of the lyrics work. He keeps changing his lyrics. You know, he thinks he doesn't. Um. And it's probably appropriate given that the song is actually about masturbation. We all know what it's about now, but I'd never worked that one out when, when you were listening to it as a child. But, you know, it's about masturbation, isn't it? And looking at girls and pretty pictures of girls. And had I known, I probably would listen to it a lot more closely. I mean, Townsend, a lot of Townsend's writing, early writing, would also sort of, it would, he wasn't afraid to flirt with any kind of sexual imagery that, that had obviously been around him as a you know, when he was younger, so Pictures of Lily, of course, is all about having a tug to a porn mag. I wouldn't say they were average pop songs by any means. They still had interesting ideas, um, strange, rather quirky little songs, though they were. Quite what direction Pete was going in with those. I think it was just him, you know, tipping his, his big toe into the water of that area and seeing what, what how it worked, because he could. What The Who never lost was that, that driving urgency behind their music. So that was always the basis, you know, that, that kind of that, that raging fury that, that starts with my generation, you know, and that's the basis for a lot of their singles. What about musical quality, though? You said that mm. you didn't think your group had got any. Well, why don't you try and give it some? It's not it's got anything to do with quality. We're more interested in, in production and, and keeping moving, you know, and I think quality leads to a sort of Stasism, you know, really. But uh, and what do you mean by that? I mean. Well, it means that if you don't, if you if you steer clear of quality, you're all right, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, how really, this is the truth, you know. How long do you think audiences are going to go on accepting this um, this music that hasn't got any quality? Don't you think that people are going to suddenly well, come to the conclusion? What's got quality in the pop business? You know, what's got quality in anything? You know, I mean. It's, it's just a sort of a matter of standards, you know, and I mean, standards are exploited in thousands of books, you know, you can, if, if, you, if you're after sort of standards, you can find them anywhere, you know, but in the pop business, you know, we're lucky in that there are no standards, you know.
Substitute again has that fantastic ability of Pete Townsend to be wry, sly and humorous at the same time. To come up with a line like I was born with a plastic spoon in my mouth is a wonderful way of, of representing itself because it turned the whole thing about born with a silver spoon on its head. And also it, it was the beautifully observed frustration again about I'm just really astounding. People don't really want me for what I am. They want me for what they think I represent. And it, it was Pete Townsend starting to show the sort of frustration that was very personal. It was, don't take the superficial, look beneath the surface, because there is something there that you'll want to understand and, re and relate to. And of course, it, again, it had a wonderful melody. And again, it had that fantastic vocal harmony on the chorus, which is Roger Daughtry almost harmonizing with himself. You hear it in your head as a harmony, but in reality it isn't. And th that was the beauty of what The Who were doing at the time. They were very clever pop performers who actually were doing something that no one else was really attempting. It's this whole pretense. They were getting across the fact that they were trying to better themselves, but everything wasn't as it seemed. And uh, it's extraordinary lyrics for the time. Substitute is the best song that Pete Townsend had written since my generation. Um, the opening chord sequence is actually one that he fell in love with and you'll find it used in all kinds of boom songs. Lyrically, it's, it's a story about denial, really. They, they were pop songs that actually said something. You know, it wasn't, I love you, baby, you're so sweet, you know, suck my feet. It, it was something that had some beef to it. So, it would, you know, we, we felt that um, they were very fresh, very new, and, and spoke for our generation. I mean, again, it's, it's more of that thunderous kind of rock that The Who were packaged into sort of like three, three and a half minutes. It turned, I think, The Who from uh, where they could have been uh, stamped with their a pop act that are a bit weird and they won't last long into actually we're not a pop act and we're a lot deeper. The fact that you've got a quick one while he's away on um, a quick one and You've got Rael on sellout. You know, these are the big indications of, of where Townsend would go. I mean, he never loses sight of the fact he can also write a bloody good pop or rock song. Um, but he can also do all this wonderful sort of connecting music that, that can link whole bits together, should he so please. Some styles, yes, my Washington. 